hello, my name is Chris Foster. Um, I sort of stumbled on inheriting the Ground Beetle recording scheme, looking after it uh, a couple of years ago. And to date, I'm sort of the, the person who's running the scheme, organizing it. I'm still in the process of trying to recruit some other people because I, I think the old fashioned notion, if it is old fashioned, that there would be a national recorder for a group who's sort of all high and mighty and, and does it all is probably not going to work. So actually there are lots of aspects to running a, a scheme. Um, there, there's sort of the taxonomic expertise, but there's also uh, meeting recorders and talking to people and doing the media sites. There's lots of stuff and it, it's a lot for one person, but I'm doing my best. So if anyone is out there as a potential budding brown beetle enthusiast who would like to contribute, maybe at the end of the talk, you might feel like that could be you. So that'd be great. Um, so I, I'm trying to pitch this, I think, at a level that will suit as wide a range of abilities in terms of identification as possible. But I do come at it mostly as a sort of a beginner talk, but mostly because that's how I identify myself. So I, I'm confident with the common ground beetles. I am aware of the rarer ones. I, I can identify quite a few of them. There are lots I haven't seen. So the common species is where I am, but also as a general overview uh, in my day job at the University of Reading, I do a lot of work with students on identif identifying all sorts of groups of wildlife. I'm a general wildlife enthusiast. Uh, ground beetles are just one of the groups that I, I like, and that's how I got into the scheme and find myself doing talks like this, which is great. It's a real, really great way to challenge myself to, to sort of push the limits of what I know. So we're going to talk about a little bit about how to find ground beetles. Where would you look? Where would you expect to find them? How would you go about making it more likely that you find some? Uh, we'll cover identification in two slightly different ways. And then a bit at the end about, well, once you found some, how do you let us know at the scheme? How would you go about recording it? That's me. I sort of introduced myself already. Um, I've got uh, the Twitter in there for myself and for the Ground Beetle scheme. Should you feel like following us if you're on Twitter? We're the, we're the positive corner of Twitter rather than the people being angry with each other. The wildlife side of Twitter, as you, you may know if you're there, it is a much more positive and friendly place on the whole. Uh, I set this up uh, a couple of years ago, just to again, try and make it feel like um, the ground beetle recording scheme was a thing. Because I think for a while it was a repository of information. There's no criticism of the people who are running it. It's a big thing. Um, some of the other recording schemes are doing really well at reaching out to people and connecting to new recorders. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. It's quite a nice size group of beetles. So this is just some of the diversity. I think this is most of the genera to each genus of ground beetle in the UK. You will find me using ground beetle and carabid interchangeably. Sometimes the carabid is just the short form of the scientific family name carabidae. Uh, and it's a relatively easy one to get on with. In some ways, I like it better than ground beetles because that sort of sounds like ground almonds. It's a really naff name. It's, it's the thing that's been mashed up. So in some ways they need a better name and not all of them are always on the ground. So, although generally it does work. We have about 360-ish species, depending on which list you look at. And you'll find a lot of keys, keys to ground beetles, which is kind of the, the traditional way of sort of sitting down and identifying an insect. We'll kind of go very systematically to subfamily, to tribe, to genus. Uh, and that I'm going to do a little bit of that but mostly I'm sort of going to flip it around and try and look at this from perspective of, well, what sorts of appearance do we find within the ground beetles? How can that help us divide them up? So it's sort of a bit of both, really. There are some really accessible species that are distinctive and things you can recognize in the field and also features you can use to identify things in the field. So that's what I want to concentrate on. And some of this will be a bit of a whirlwind. I've probably got way too much content because to start with 360 species, where do I stop? So if I'm going too fast at any point and you have questions, uh, either store them up to the end or, or wave at me to slow down. There is some information that you don't need to read. It's always a risk that something on a slide which you don't expect people to read, but I probably do it. Um, and just another quick word about the species in uh, this country. Uh, I, I go by a Mark Telfer's Species Status Review from 2016. Mark uh, was running the scheme before I was and he's the he is still the sort of fount of information for ground beetles and very kindly does answer my emails <laughs> when I have questions and 
of our 374 species that were reviewed in that, so again, depending on which list you look at, we've got quite a few endangered species from the countries. We've got sort of 30-ish given an endangered status. Uh, a few we're not really sure about, which don't have enough data to say. Um, 34, which are kind of threatened. So actually quite a lot are doing just fine. But that's based on fairly strict criteria of actually uh, there being a threat to its population viability. Within all the other species, which are under the IUCN rules least concern, there are lots which have probably declined quite a bit compared to what they used to be. And I've got put a couple of examples here just because they're nice species. Um, we've got Caribus manilus, one of the big greenish uh, Caribus species, which is one I always like to use because we have or had a population on the University of Reading campus, completely uh, urban surrounded campus, although it's uh, definitely a declining species. And then really cool stuff like Drypta, which again, I won't talk about again for the rest of the talk, so I'm going to try and focus on common things you're actually like to find. So how would you go about doing that? Well, I always start with opportunistically because I'm a general naturalist. I'm out and about looking for wildlife and I'm just sort of looking for things to happen. I love observing insects. When I go into the garden, I like to sort of watching them and seeing what they do. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll take specimens and identify or take pictures. Sometimes I just watch, especially if they're species I, I recognize well. And this is one now, I completely forget where I took the picture, but I quite like this was a this is one of the really common species that I will come on to called Pterostichus madidus, and it is scavenging a, a dead wasp there. So there's some, some really nice behavior you get from ground beetles. And this one I stumbled on, uh, another big carabus that I will mention. I stumbled on when I was out looking for night jars, and I was coming back with my torch on the path, and you see ground beetles running around, as many are nocturnal. So that is a kind of first way you find them kind of generally searching around. Uh, and these are some pictures I took earlier in the week. I was on a really nice field margin um, with some big uh, plots of bumblebee food, essentially, that um, are part of their stewardship scheme on the farm and a barley crop behind me. And along the edge of the margin between them is all this crumbly ground. And what I expected to find in some of the cracks was ground beetles. Indeed, I did, there were lots of ground beetles. Uh, underneath stones, underneath things, because lots of the species are nocturnal, during the day you sort of have to find where they're hiding. So grubbing around at the base of plants, turning things over just with your hand, breaking open the soil. I was finding plenty that way. Then there were some more day active species which were also running around in the sun. And open, bare, quite warm ground is great for that because you see them moving. Uh, there are species which prefer to be away from the sun and in shade and that's not the best place to see those. But I really like looking for ground beetles in a sort of open, slightly baked habitat. Not too hot, because I don't like it that hot. Another really classic way of finding them is, of course, pitfall traps, dig a hole in the ground and, and let beetles fall in. That's basically as complicated as it has to get. Again, I realized I didn't have any of my own pictures of pitfall traps that I've set because I finished digging it and I move on. And, and I should kind of think, I always take a picture to illustrate things, but. I never do. So this is someone else's quite posh with uh, guides for the beetles to hit and then walk along to the trap. I don't usually bother. I occasionally set them in my garden. Just two nested plastic cups, one inside the other, drainage holes in the bottom cup, usually a little lid on the top. So whatever works, I use plastic Petri dishes because where I work, I can find lots of them lying around propped up on sticks or stones. Just keeps the rain out, keeps out small mammals, that sort of thing, leave a gap for beetles to go under. And I leave mine dry in the garden, just with some leaf litter and other bits of soil or whatever that they actually would like to be in, and then check them every day or so. And then you're not upsetting, upsetting the insects too much. And many of the research traps will be set with fluid, which kills the specimen, which if you're just kind of getting started, you might not want to do that. Or if you actually know your species quite well, you might just want to pick out the ones that you can't identify there and then, and the rest you just let them go. And in my garden, that's what I like to do. That's kind of hours of fun in the garden, one or two pitfall traps in flower borders and under trees. And then some people get really into uh, working through plant material for beetles and do this thing called tussocking, which is not something I've done a lot of. It sounds slightly suspect, uh, but I've put a couple of links, which if you get in, if in the recorded version, you might be able to come back to those. So I thought I'd put them in there. Some nice descriptions, one from 
uh, Northwestern Vertebrates, on looking for beetles in the winter. And lots of things you find would be ground beetles, pulling out clumps of grass and then working through the base. That's where lots of species go to overwinter. So uh, a lot of ground beetles breed in the autumn uh, and then will overwinter as adults. Increasingly though, in, again, in my own garden, I'm finding a lot of ground beetles at my moth trap, which I now try to refer to as a light trap, because of course it attracts all sorts of other insects and can get some interesting things turning up. This is a species called Ophonus ardociacus, which we used to think was relatively scarce, but in the last year, there were lots of records uh, quite widespread across England at, at light. It's kind of lovely, slight blue metallic sheen, orange legs, uh, rounded thorax, it's relatively characteristic. There are one or two vaguely similar, but it's quite straightforward to identify that from a good photograph or a half decent photograph, not even that good. As this, this is through a tube uh, from, taken at my light trap. And that, so that's actually revealing some new uh, distribution, which we didn't necessarily know about, perhaps a species which is slightly cryptic, difficult to find in the field, disappearing down cracks but we're, we're finding them at light. That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I'm happy to kind of talk in questions at the end too. I mean, I must say most of my finding of ground beetles is totally opportunistic or in pitfall traps. I'm by no means the wizard. And there are some wiz wizards out there. If you go out with someone who is a really expert uh, field ground beetler, uh, it's amazing what you can actually do. So I'll get onto the meat of what I'm talking about, which is identification. I thought we'd start with, well, 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 what is a ground beetle? What makes a ground beetle a ground beetle? It seems a good place to start. So it, it's, a, it's a family of mostly predatory beetles. Um, some of them are sort of generalist omnivores. A few are specialists on seeds. So they predate seeds, if you like, but mostly predators and they're built for uh, being predators. They've got long legs, sort of quite flattened and sleek. They run fast. If you encounter them in the field, you'll see many of them can move really quite impressively fast, especially tiger beetles, one of the fastest animals on the planet for its body length. And there are a couple of other features as well, which you can use if you're not quite sure. Their antennae are always filiform, sort of just regular antennae with bits one after the other, all the same width, nothing fancy like a club or a fan, as you get on some of the other sort of large black beetles, potentially. I mentioned long legs. You also see quite often on many of the species, quite obvious protruding jaws, um, because again, they're predators, they've got quite tough jaws which stick out ready to grab hold of prey. So those are things you can look for. So I'm gonna start with a, a few pictures of things which may or may not be ground beetles. And hopefully if the wizardry works, we have a poll for you to uh, have a go. So given what I've just said, and th these are all things, well, three of these four, are th the four you'll see, I think, um, I do see. So here's, here's the poll. I'm going to move it off my screen, otherwise you'll see who's answering what. These may or may not be straightforward. And this, this is, um, yeah, so the beetle you see quite often out and about in the right sort of habitat. Yeah, so that's our result. 83% say no. And they're absolutely right. This is um, a door beetle, the geotropes. Got these little clubbed antennae. It's also very domed. Ground beetles are usually much flatter. I do very occasionally see records of this pop up as violet ground beetle. Very, very rarely, but the odd one. And that's, that's why I put that one in. So uh, how about this next one? I'm thinking about the features that I just talked about again. It's a lovely uh, metallic blue. There certainly are metallic blue brown beetles. Got this filiform antennae, and that's the end. And we've got a slightly less uh, comprehensive answer this time, 68%, 32%. And 60%, 68% still have it. This is not a brown beetle. Um, this is the older leaf beetle which has actually been really common this year. It's quite an interesting story, but that's, that's for the leaf beetle talk. Um, so that is not a ground beetle. Again, it's a bit more domed, 
Um, and its legs just look weedier. It doesn't look built to chase things down. You can't see its mandibles, they're tucked away. Uh, it's not gonna be grabbing any prey. So that, that is not a ground beetle. Okay, have a go at this one. Absolutely a gorgeous thing, certainly, whatever it is. Wow, so we've got 66% um, two thirds went with no, and no is still right. So this is uh, one of the stag beetles, not one of the two common species. This is actually um, extremely scarce to non-existent in Britain for shame, because it's a really gorgeous thing. Um, but I thought actually, if you hit the head, um, Parts of it do look quite ground beetly. It's a lot more spiky. It's got those protruding sharp mandibles. So you could be forgiven there for thinking some of that looks like ground beetle, but those antennae are again a giveaway because you will never find a ground beetle with antennae like that. So we'll go with one more. Just look for those clues, the legs, the antennae, the general shape. So we have 60% say yes, 40% say no. Um, just to be really annoying, none of them were ground beetles. So none, none of them thought, and you probably all thought, he's bound to put one in. But actually all the, th all the other things we'll be talking about are ground beetles. So this one is not, this is a, a dark thing beetle, which is a bit of a lookalike. And the uh, Tenebrionid dark thing beetles, one of the things about them is that each species seems to look like a different family of beetles. And this is one that looks quite a lot like some of the ground beetles. So that is a trickier one. There are fewer clues. You'd actually have to look a bit more at the underside and some of the more fine structure, which I won't really get into, but it is slightly domed and sort of, again, slightly weaker looking legs. Um, it doesn't look as flat. You don't really see the strong mandibles, but it's a little more tenuous. So for that and for the fact that I, I'm cheating and I made them all no, I can let you off for saying yes, I think in that case, but that's, that's really interesting. So if you do have a ground beetle, assuming you've kind of got past all that nonsense, there are a number of ways you can kind of get into it. And what generally happens to our poor students where I work is that they just kind of get given a, a massive great book like the one on the left and told to get on with it. And they've never seen one before. And they open this and they see the key and think, what do I do? But nonetheless, that, that is the ground beetle Bible. It's a fantastic piece of work uh, to get that much information on so many species. It is sort of still essential, absolutely essential if you want to do a serious study of ground beetles in Britain or Ireland, it's got all the species for either. But there are a number of sort of slightly easier ways in. I mean, first of all, I'm going to tell you about some of the more common species, but there are also these lovely uh, online PDF guides to some of the uh, genus too, which uh, John Waters and Mark Telford produced. And anywhere, any group that I look at later on for which there is one of these, I've just given you the number TW whatever 11. And then you can download them all if you take a note from John Walter's website. They're all there to download. Fabulous. So unfortunately, they haven't got through all the genera yet. It says we're currently working on them. It's been a while. Uh, I haven't asked Mark how whether any more are forthcoming. It would be quite nice if eventually we had the whole lot done, but it is quite an undertaking. They are a really, really fantastic, a more field guide-like resource for getting into ground beetles. So I highly recommend them. And there are some great websites out there. Again, these are kind of just for you to come back to and look at the, the links of places with great images or ground beetles correctly identified so you can double check things. So I'm just going to skip over it. I think this is being recorded so you can come back. Is that, is that correct? So I'm going to go through identification of ground beetles in two ways here. And the first is the sort of, well, microscopic features. And this isn't really the focus of the talk. So I'm going to go through some of them quite quickly. It's just a warning, but I want to put them in there because A, some of you may well find them useful, depends on what stage you are at with identifying things. And B, some of the microscopic features you can just about photograph in the field, look at with a hand lens. And then you can, if you're not sure sort of what group to fit something into, there are a few of those features that really narrow it down. Uh, otherwise you're looking at 300 and something species picked in pictures. So it's, really worth knowing just a few of the most common features that you would want to look at, usually with a microscope. But as I say, a hand lens is often good enough because some of the ground beetles are a decent size, sort of one, two centimeters. 
good hand lens will do it. So if you're someone who's used to going out and looking at mosses or grasses or something, and then you'll always carry a hand lens and you could identify ground beetles for that too. It's just a thought. Um, the other approach is what I always call to any other group of organisms because of how I started out is the sort of birding approach, which is actually just knowing a few species and the general impression of what they're like of seeing a carabus and saying, oh yeah, it's a carabus because that's generally what shape they are and what color they are. But you would rarely sort of go out, now you would if it's a bird you were totally unfamiliar with, but usually if you go out with a pair of binoculars, you're sort of, you know what finches roughly look like and you know what um, crows generally look like. So you have a feel for them. So that's what I really want to get into, having a feel for identification, sort of being confident that, yeah, I, I recognize you, I've seen you before, like an old friend. So that is the, the, the one I'll focus on a bit more and I'll do a bit less quickly. So the whole point of doing any of the microscopic features is just to appreciate, first of all, the diversity of ground beetles, because I'll show you a picture of every genus. We will rattle through them. And I'll show you a few of those features and just know what to focus on in the future. But it is not the main thrust of what I want you to take away, um, because that would be for another day, probably to do in a room with a microscope when we're able to do that. It would be easier. So there are a few things which are useful to know because I might use some of these words going on. Um, stick my little arrows on, which seem to be animated. Bits of the legs, if you're not familiar with identifying any group of insect, will refer to the femur, tibia, and tarsi, but you may well have those yourself. Uh, the pronotum is this sort of shield at the top of the thorax, the plate you see. I'll refer to that quite a lot because the shape of it is really important for identifying lots of ground beetles. And the wing cases, or oops, gone too fast. The wing cases, um, elytra, we're always referred to as elytra in beetles. I might say wing cases, doesn't really matter. And then with the tiny little things uh, next to the mandibles are the palps, and the palps sort of manipulate food items and the shape of some of those is again important for identifying some groups. Oh, and the one I really should have mentioned, I'm gonna use a little pointer here, can, maybe not, is various pores and punctures. And you will find reference in the keys to punctures or pores, uh, which are sort of little dimples, which usually hold a little hair coming out called CT. And particularly important for splitting lots of the groups off are the ones next to the eye on the head. And I'll come to that in a second. But the little hair makes much less mysterious to look for because you can see that little hair from sideways on. You can see it in a decent enough photograph. This is an amazing photograph. Obviously I didn't take any of these. Do, do know I've got all the credits in there for the people who deserve the credit. So those are CT. Oh, and I've just closed my PowerPoint. That's very clever. All right. If you can't still see it, let me know, but that should be good. Let's do that again. Right, so we'll get a quick sort of tour through. Um, most of the UK species are in a subfamily called Carabinae, but don't worry too much about that. Um, but a few, the few that aren't are really obvious. That's why I put it up here. The tiger beetles look like tiger beetles. You've probably seen a tiger beetle or know of, so I don't really need to explain how to recognize one. That's what they look like. That's a tiger beetle. Then we've got um, a couple more, this weird thing that doesn't look like a ground beetle at all called a Mofrin. It's quite rare, absolutely gorgeous. I'd love to see one. It's basically unmistakable for any UK beetle. But there it is, almost ladybirdish. And then there, there we've got the bombardier beetles, two species of Rachinus, uh, sort of orange, uh, front half orange thorax, um, lovely iridescent blue or green wing cases, quite characteristic shape and colors and one scarce and one extremely rare. So that's that. That's all the subfamilies. So subfamily, easy. That part's very straightforward. And then if you were working through the key, and I'm just going to show you a few other things you'll come up against to help you, you will find a question about the structure of the front leg. And some ground beetles have got a fairly simple, so don't worry about the text. That's kind of, this is my sort of draft guide to doing this. So don't read it, I shouldn't have left it on there, but never mind, it's there, I've kind of used the slides. And we've got this, uh, if we use the pointer again, gradually expanding, but otherwise smooth front part of the leg, if that makes sense. And then on the rest of the species, 
you have might be the same shape or it might expand a lot like this one, but you have some kind of depression or notch in the leg. And this is the antennal cleaner. So the beetle gets its antennae and runs it through that to, to clean it off. So some species do not have one and some do. So the keys use that. Actually, in the, at the right angle, even not particularly in focus picture, you can actually see that and you maybe be able to see it with the hand lens if you're holding on to a beetle in the field too. So it's worth knowing about. But don't worry about it too much. And this takes you to, so each time you kind of go through one of these questions, you get a choice of genera, and then you start to notice actually some of them are very distinctive. So the carabus include the violet ground beetle. You've got this big uh, thing with a very round pronotum, weird shaped long head called cicrus, various other kind of shiny things, um, but they're kind of easy enough characters to look at. So again, you don't worry about the detail of them, but once you've kind of got over the hurdle of, I wonder what shaped leg it has, then you've narrowed it down to, if you've got no antenna cleaner, you narrow it down to about sort of 10 options. So not too bad. Yeah, I think a lot of this is going to be more useful for you to pause and come back to. And I'm sort of in the middle of trying to build this. I'm mean, going to be using someone else's pictures. They're, they're not copyrighted, but I sort of feel like eventually I should ask permission to. So I haven't really got it to a publishable stage, but I'd like to put this together as a usable guide to Jenna. So if, if the format of it kind of works, and when you go back, it seems to, or if you have any suggestions, I would absolutely love to hear from you afterwards. Uh, I'm also anxious. I've used lots of the the wording at the moment from Martin Luff's key. So I need to kind of rework that because I'm basically plagiarizing it. So it's not all my own work by any means, but I've tried to put it into a new helpful format that eventually might work for you. Then there's a number of kind of really distinctive groups. You've got this thing called Larissera, which I will talk about in a bit with bristly antennae. You've got the ground beetles built for digging. So they've got digging legs, so you can recognize them on their own. A couple of other sort of more obscure features, but then if you had a microscope, you could look for them. And that narrows all those down. And the next kind of character I want to look at, again, this one is really not very important because they're tiny beetles that you probably will struggle with initially, um, but it's the last segment of the outside pair of palps. Uh, has got a tiny, tiny little pin shape. And this is something you'll come across in the key. If you know where to look, it's quite easy. Um, but if but, so that, but if you don't, it's maybe not. So that's why I put the picture in here. If you have been trying to key out brown beetles and you're not sure about this feature, um, that's what you're looking for, the thing on the left, just this tiny, tiny little strip. So sometimes uh, people read that, say a very small last segment of the palp, and they don't really know what very small means. It means really small, really small, really narrow. Okay, so that, again, you can forget that for the rest of the evening. That's just to sort of help. And this leads, if you've got one like the one on the left, it leads you to uh, a number of sort of rarish um, genera, but then it leads you to Bembidian, with tiny little ground beetles, averaging about four millimeters and loads of species. That's a difficult genus. So that's as far as I'm gonna go into Bembidian now, because we don't have time. But I don't have time really to do everything else I've prepared, but we'll, we'll see how we go. And then you can split off another tiny little group I won't talk about again after this picture called uh, the Trekini. It's a tribe of various uh, genera of ground beetles, and they've got these semicircles on the head. So that is another feature if you're kind of stuck for something to look at on your beetles, give you a clue where to go. Look for those semicircular furrows, and if you have them, you've got lucky. Um, because, turn off the pointer, you're again down to just six genera and most of them are very difficult to find. Uh, Trekus, relatively common. So you might have one of these. And I was talking to Gary about this thing at the bottom left at the beginning, uh, this Epus. These are very weird, almost maritime ground beetles. It's so very cool, but unfortunately, we're not talking about them again this evening. Then you have quite a few uh, genera, and you can see them all here, with truncate elytra. It just means their wing cases look like someone's taken a pair of scissors and gone snip. And that's, they're, they're like a normal wing case, just cut off. And some of them are a bit more rounded than that, but on the whole, they've just been snipped right across. Um, the only caution here is if you've actually done some pitfall drafting and caught beetles that are in fluid, because then the abdomen swells, it goes beyond the tip of the elytra, 
and it looks like the elytra are short. So it isn't really about whether the abdomen protrudes, because if the, the beetle is swollen for any reason, it will. It's more about the shape of it. But in a sort of normal dry specimen or live specimen that doesn't isn't uh, super swollen because it's gravid or whatever, you will find um, that you will find that the wing cases are short in the abdomen only in these. So that's quite a nice feature. Most of these are quite small. So sort of four, five, six, seven millimeters. So again, most of these I won't get into too much, but some quite distinctive ones. So I will mention a few. And there they are. So this would be part of my draft guide to each genus, which will need a lot more text, a lot more sorting out, but this is roughly sort of the, the idea of what we're looking for. These little uh, sort of dark colored ones look quite a lot like a Bembidian in the field, the Microlestes and the Syntomus in the middle, in the blue. Uh, but again, just a little snipped off elytra, a really good clue. I hope that's all making sense so far. If I look across, that's my other screen where it's really big um, and some of your faces in front of the other one, so apologies. And this is the really, I think, the really useful one for field identification. And this is the one that may look sort of completely obscure, but I'd like to uh, talk about a little more. So this is uh, the number of citiferous punctures on the head. And remember, a puncture is just something, a citiferous is just for hairy, it's hair bearing. A puncture is something with a hair coming out of it. And they're actually, this is a picture I took, sort of not that great picture, it's quite blurry, as you can see, holding onto a ground beetle but I got it sideways on and you can see the little hair sticking out. This one I took this week, a bit more successful, a bit sharper on the right. And you can see the one on the right, it's just got one in the center of the eye. The one on the left has two. The hairs can occasionally rub off, which is a bit of a pain, but most live specimens you find shouldn't have lost any. It's possible, but they usually won't have done. And in, in any case, the one, the one will be on its own in the middle and the two will usually be sort of at the top and the bottom of the eye, roughly speaking. So I think this is actually quite a really useful feature because it separates out two really big sections of the ground beetles. So if you kind of got no clue, checking that, maybe only finding one, really narrows things down. So if, it, if, you're, if it's all possible and you're taking a picture of one in the field uh, or if you're trying to key one, that's something to go straight to and just have a look and you may be able to then jump straight to another part of the key. So with two punctures, again, quite a bit of choice, but lots of things which are fairly distinctive. Uh, and some of them I'm going to talk about, so I'm not going to sort of dwell on them now. So apologies for sort of showing you something and taking it away again. And there's a few more, again, a few other little features which you can look at like uh, toothed claws, that got little rows of teeth inside the claws. That's not something you'd really look at in the field. It's quite tough under a microscope sometimes, but it's really definitive if it's there. So it's useful to know. And then there are a few more, some various color ones. These all have got two hairs. So it's quite, that is quite a lot, but it means you know it's not going to be any of the ones that only have one. So the one on the right. Um, and this one on the right is Harpalus rufopes, which is an extremely common species. So again, if you're not sure, then it's worth checking for that one hair or two, because that takes you to some weird rare things you'll never see. Uh, Callistus, basic on the left, the beautiful orange and black thing is probably extinct in Britain. So sorry for putting it there and tempting you, um, but it, it's a gorgeous species. You might see Clenius, uh, green, sort of yellow end of the abdomen, slightly yellow hairs all over it. That's an absolutely gorgeous species, Clenius vestitus. And there's some little things, but most importantly, you've got the harp alliance. And there are lots and lots of ground beetles in this group, which have one, uh, Cetiferous puncture by the eye. Some small ones along the bottom row, sort of more or less brown and orange in various color patterns. Um, we've got the Harpalus themselves, quite a lot of species. It's another relatively difficult genus, but with some extremely easy species to identify, relatively easy species. And then a couple of other sort of rarer things and hairy winged things, a couple more Harpalus are not. So you've got the one hair, and then for the Harpalus, you look at whether or not there's hair on the elytra. And that, on the next picture you'll see, is also something you can do in the field. Like how hairy are those wing cases? So that, none of that may have made sense, but it's just to kind of get you into the mindset of well, what is the range of species that's out there. And that we've now seen a picture of every genus. Not for very long, obviously, but you've seen a picture of every genus. So I hope that will help with what remains. 
So for the rest of it, I'm going to look at just kind of general impression. What are some species you might encounter and what they look like? Um, and I will come to both of these in a second, but that's our Harpalus rufopes on the left. The Harpalus rufopes got lovely red legs, it's rufopes, and it's got a sort of dusting of yellow hair all over the wing cases, which means they get really grotty. So if you pick it out of a, a moth trap, it's often got moth scales stuck all over its back. This came out of the field margin this week. It's got sort of dusty, grubby grit all over it. And you can just about see the yellow hairs too. And I'll show you an even worse, well, that's not a bad picture, I'm quite pleased with that. I'll show you a terrible picture, I took a one later, which still has enough in it, pretty much to narrow it down to this one and maybe one other species. So the one thing you may well have seen if you're out on heath or lucky enough to see one of the rare ones on the coast is tiger beetles. And if you've got a tiger beetle, nine times out of 10, it's green tiger beetle. And it's the only one that really looks like that with the yellow markings on the top of the wing cases. So it's very easy to split green tiger beetle, the common one, from the rarer things. And the rarer things you'll pretty much only see on heaths for the one at the bottom, the heath wood or wood tiger beetle, depending on what name you give it. And the, uh, oops, sorry about that. Or, or the, uh, the June tiger beetle at the top will be on June's coasts, June slacks. Um, two species there split by range. So you've got the Northern June tiger beetle um, is found on the Lancashire coast. Um, I don't know exactly how far it extends, I should know. And the, uh, the normal, regular June tiger beetle goes quite a long way around uh, sort of the, the east and the southwest. But you've got to be on the coast to find them. You've got to be on a sort of nice patch of heathland or sort of sandy, uh, dry woodland in the southeast to find the heath tiger beetle. And the cliff tiger beetle is just a few sites on the south coast, so it's quite scarce. So tiger beetles are no problem for recording a really nice group uh, to, to go and look for. Another thing people encounter a lot are the caribus. They've got really long wing cases. They're quite big, generally, sort of the smallest. They, they're the sort of one to two centimeter range and more up to three. So they're quite, they're quite big uh, as beetles go. Um, some of our biggest. And there are 11 species. So again, it's a tractable group and a few of those are rare. So it's relatively straightforward. They have a couple of sort of lookalikes in the Cicrus, which is the sna uh, snail hunting species. That long head is to get into snail shells. And it's got a weird shape. Again, it's really, rather than describing it, you just sort of look at it. And when you see that again, you kind of recognize it. So that's Cicrus. And this is a woodland species under logs, a sort of in damp places. Relatively common, don't find it all the time. It's a nice thing to find. And then we have this thing called the caterpillar uh, hunter, Callosoma inquisitor. That I've never seen, I'd really like to. It's sort of widespread, but not that common. Mostly because it's up in trees, a rare ground beetle that's spending most of its time in, in the trees uh, hunting caterpillars. And then we have a very occasional visiting version of this, slightly different species with amazing colors, which would be a total dream to see, but very few people in this country ever have. But I put it in there because it's awesome. And I like looking at pictures of Callosoma sycophantum. So our, for recording, one of the things that comes in a lot is the violet ground beetle. And lots of people see this out and about. It's very difficult to miss. You see it walking across paths, walking through undergrowth. Well, there are actually two species that we call violet ground beetle. And if you look at um, Mark and John's guides, T and guide number one, you'll see them refer to it as the ridged violet ground beetle, the second species, Carabus problematicus. This has got all these little ridges on the back. So if you've got a violet ground beetle, you want to get a good top-down picture showing the structure. There are a few of violet ground beetles also have little ridges on the back, perhaps not as organized. So the other thing you've got to look at is the general shape. And the violet ground beetle has got long, these long wing cases and a very sort of square pronosa. Whereas on the other species, Carabus problematicus, the problem that there's a second, uh, it, they're not as parallel sided on the pronotum. Um, the purple sheen can actually go a bit more extensively over the top, but that's not the best guide. Uh, and they're alike to us, slightly shorter relative to everything else. They're a little bit smaller too on average. So again, structurally, they're quite different and a decent picture top down or, or sideways on just to show that this shape of the side of the pronotum will work well. I occasionally still see a picture of a slightly odd one at a weird angle that I struggle with. So they, they're easy, but they're not. So they're kind of a weird pair. Um, but 
but definitely one you can get to grips with in the field and really nice species to find. And there's a, there's a third sort of quite similar, which can often have a blue or violet sheen on the pronotum, but it's got bronze uh, elytra with little dimples running down, sort of two, three lines of little dimples. And this is Carabus nemoralis. Again, it's quite, that's quite common. It's almost more common in urban areas than the violet ground beetle. And a decent sort of sideways on image showing the dimples uh, identifies this species really well from the violet ground beetle. Uh, I get very few records, of course, of the blue ground beetle, which is much rarer, but I occasionally get um, very bluish looking um, Carabus problematicus uh, recorded as Carabus infricatus, which is much, much rarer. But also if you look at it, it's a very different build again. It's even thinner, thinner, uh, much more bumpy. It's a very different looking species well, if you've looked at a lot of them. So that's the, if you're not sure, and also it's only found in sort of the odd oak wood in, in Wales and Southwest England, uh, not that common. Again, would love to see this one. And these are all sort of big slug specialists. They chase after um, slugs, earthworms, got larger prey, and can live for probably a surprisingly long time, sort of a few years maybe. So almost like little birds in um, prey size and longevity uh, and just as good. There are a few more ca caribus I wanted to throw in. Um, because again, you, you might find these, these are sort of bronzish greenish ones. And the one on the right doesn't usually look quite that green, but the metallic reflection in that picture has really come through. These are granulatus arvensis and manilis. Uh, and granulatus, I see a lot of records of, it's quite common in sort of slightly damp open places. And it's got this string of sausages along the back, separated by single ridges. Uh, Caribus arvensis has got slightly thinner sausages, separated by a couple of ridges. And Manilus is much more delicate. It's got little beads, not really sausages anymore. They're a bit too small, separated by three ridges. So it's kind of going from bigger, chunkier ridges and sausages on the left through to smaller on the right. You'll also notice the shape of the pronotum again. That's another useful thing to always look for. It's almost parallel in granulatus, and it's a little bit rounded in the other two. Arvensis is sort of a moorland heath species. Um, Monilus uh, grassland and definitely declining, sort of old grassland field edges. Um, not totally sure what's going on with that one. The most ground beetles you'll find, most of the rest are just kind of generically like this. And this is where we stumble. We sort of have these blackish looking species. There are lots of patterned and bright colored ones, but about half the species, my reckoning is a spuriously accurate 54% are predominantly black or dark brown. Um, one in three of them is pretty widespread. So there are about 60 species that you could be dealing with. And that, that is a problem. But I'm gonna go through some of the more common ones and just see how we get on. Um, and these, these slides are the kind of don't pay so much attention again, because I've shown you lots of the options, but I'm just trying to show you ways you could start to break down the, all those species for yourself again. So I've kind of poured through the list and thought, well, which ones are smallish and mostly dark and try to put them all in one place. So I'm going to mention them all in one go because I want to save time for the species I want to focus. But that is one thing you could do to start narrowing it down is actually be quite systematic about, well, my beetle was yay big. And knowing, the si knowing the rough size is really useful if you've got some kind of size guide in, in your photo or if you've got the specimen, measure it. Then it really narrows things down. Some, some of the diverse genera are unhelpful and there'll be lots of sizes, but in some cases it narrows it right down. So there's some small dark ones and it gives you sort of eight or so different choices with not too many species. Um, it's the medium dark ones that are, are the issue. Uh, but again, we've looked at some of those microscopic features that you could remember to try and look for. Uh, and then other things that are really useful. So shape of pronotum, again, like in the carabus, shape of pronotum is hugely helpful because if you look across this page, it varies a lot. From the, the platinus, I've got this really sinuate one. It kind of comes in an S shape. It's quite narrow, but you can't see it well in this picture. I've got a better one. It's got ridges on the side. That's the sort of second from top, right? Don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. And then you've got uh, the Amara, some of which are quite metallic, so they're useful. They have this totally smooth outline where the pronotum and the elytra just kind of go in a straight line. So that's a hugely characteristic shape. There are very few other species like that. 
um, stomus above it, so much narrower pronotum. So although they all just look like black beetles, when you start looking more closely, you do see quite big differences. And this is a really common one that has another feature which enables you to identify it straight away. So I want to throw this one in. This is called Larissa pilicornis. It is a specialist hunter of springtails and it has these lovely bristles all over its mouth parts and antennae for entrapping springtails. Uh, big dimples on the back, it's a bronze color. That's really common in most habitats. So one that if you can just get a good look at the antennae, you can identify straight away. It's one of the, it's basically the exception to the rule of normal antennae and ground beetles. It's the only one I can think of off the top of my head with something wacky going on. Quite similar in terms of going after springtails, I, th I think on the whole are the Lystus, uh, sometimes referred to as plate jaws. They will be in uh, Mark and John's guide. Lystus have got these very rounded pronotums and massive great wide plate-like jaws, but you may not see that straight away, but it's that shape of the pronotum that's really useful. Uh, it just sort of goes way out to the side and comes back in, sort of in varying amounts, and that helps identify species. And there, these are three common sort of darkish ones you'll see. Spinobarbus, lovely blue metallic, not quite such a, a strongly narrowed pronotum at the bottom. Fulvibarbus, slightly less blue, but a little bit blue. Very sort of wacky, goes way out to the side and comes back in. Uh, so I'm going to hear footsteps because someone's just rung on our door. And Rufa marginatus with big red sides. And those three are pretty easy to tell apart. Spinobarbus and Fulvibarbus can be a bit tricky. So good top down pictures again are really great for records. Quite a similar shape in the pronotum is something called the Bria. And the Bria brevicollis is like our, if you were identifying waders on the shore, if you're into your birds, the Bria brevicollis is the sort of dunlin of these. It's the kind of, it's the standard one, one of the two standard ones to be able to pick out of the lineup first to know that it's not one of the others. So get to know the Bria brevicollis. Um, Heart Shields is Mark and John's name in the, in the guide. I don't know if it's a genuine common name, but it sort of alludes to this heart shape pronotum. Again, it sort of goes out to the side, comes back in little straight lines and then right angles at the corners. There's one species that looks almost identical to Nebria brevicollis, um, which has, which, uh, which doesn't have any hairs on the top of its feet. Nebria brevicollis does. So if you do record this, I can't be totally sure unless the image is really good of its feet, which it is. So that is something to kind of learn to check with the lens, if you can, it's the top of the hind feet, Nebria brevicollis, little silvery hairs. It's a little bit tricky. It's kind of annoying that it's super common and yet actually it's not quite one you can just do straight away on site. Sometimes it gets confused a bit with Lystus if, if you've got a Lystus which doesn't look particularly blue. They're in the same tribe, their pronotums are very similar shape. But for, in that case, you check out the big jaws on Lystus and you'll never see the metallic blue like that in Nebria. Just have a little swig. So I want to have time to get onto the colourful ones, but I'm sort of running out fast. These three are sort of almost more straight-sided in the pronotum, and with kind of pale orangish brownish legs. Um, with again minute differences, which actually help me identify species. So Calathus rotundicollis and Fuscopes are both very common things you will find. Sinucus a bit smaller, less so, but I put it there for comparison for those who are interested in. Uh, had like me sort of heard of this, but wondered where they were. They, I may, they may be nested within that, my collection. I've got to check because I sort of recently discovered, oh wait, this exists. So Rotunda Collis is a kind of woodland, uh, damp, shady place species with slightly round hind angles on the pronotum. Hind angle is the back, it's the bottom corner. And Fuscopes is much straighter. And Fuscopes likes open places, but they're both really common. So you, are, you will likely find those turning over logs or just watching ground beetles run around at night. These are two you'll find very often. Likewise, in damp and shady places, turning logs over, you'll find Plotinus similis, which you'll find in similar sorts of places, but it's quite different because it's got that very narrow, very small pronotum with sort of the corner coming right in, in sinuate shape. That's my, why my red arrow's there. So those are the kind of common medium-sized dark things. And then we move on to the, the chunkier ones. Um, 
I, I forgot to mention the, the little numbers here refer to the sort of page number in Genesis guide that I've skipped through very fast. And so just sort of ignore those numbers for now. But if you want to come back to navigating this presentation, it may or may not help you, but it, it was vaguely to help me. But one massive, great, wonderful coastal species you find sort of on beaches called Broscus, um, but it's not that common. And there are a few other even rarer, massive dark species, which I haven't bothered to put on here less likely to find starting out, but you will see lots of pterostichus, which come in a range of sizes, but uh, among the most common are some bigger species. Uh, Abax, about two centimeters long and dead straight down the sides. That's why they call it Parallelopipedus. Favorite name for a ground beetle, probably Abax Parallelopipedus. And the, the sort of easiest harpalus to identify, apart from its one very occasional sort of lookalike, Harpalus rufopes with its hairy back. So those are kind of the, the big dark things you'll see quite often. And the really common thing is Pterostichus madibus. It's probably the commonest species. Uh, if, and, if, and the key for that one is these round hind angles on its pronotum. So round hind angles, Pterostichus madibus. There are other species that are a bit smaller with it, but those round hind, hind angles kind of robust. Uh, it's Pterostichus, sort of get to know what Pterostichus looks like. Uh, and that's what, that's what they look like. There's a red-legged and a black-legged version. So with red legs, it's pretty much unmistakable from any other species. So even at this weird angle, I can see the rounded corners and the red legs and say, yep, that's Pterostichus madibus. Uh, so red-legged version, fine. Black-legged one, there are a couple of scarce species which also have these round hind angles. And in that case, uh, and one of them is super scarce, so probably won't find it. The other is relatively common in, in the uh, sort of moors of the west and the north. Uh, so get a good top-down image again. There are a couple of differences which are a bit technical to get into now, but a good top-down picture will show which one you have. And also size, Madibus, a bit bigger. So you will find these, probably have seen this. Then the, next to the Abax, for comparison, a couple of really big pterostichus. One you'll find in sort of arable margins and gardens is Melonarius, uh, which looks quite similar, but to Abax, but the pronotum, they go slightly round at the side instead of almost in a line down to the elytra with a little tooth. So it's sort of got this different structure and it doesn't have these kind of big shoulders. Abax have shoulder pads sort of raised in the corners. Um, that they just have a slightly more, they just look wider all the way down, if that makes sense. Uh, if you look, if you're in sort of um, damp grass and uh, woodland, you might find Pterostichus niger. Not quite as common, widespread as Melanarius, but it, it is everywhere, pretty much. Um, very nice species to find. I really like this. So, so, I don't really know why, I just, I just like finding it. Uh, slightly narrower pronotum than either, which is, rather than just rounded all the way around, just starts to come back in. So that's what we call sinuate again. Uh, again, good top-down picture, all three, relatively straightforward. Oh yeah, there's the straight lines for that. Harpalus roof piece, the yellow hairs we've covered. And there's, there's another common harpalus which has got hairs only on the outside, but that one comes in a rainbow of colors. But occasionally does come in black, so that's when you check whether the hairs are all over the wing cases or just on top. So harpalus affinis is another really common one, but it's often, most often in metallic green, a really, really beautiful beetle that. Sort of similar to the, uh, the darker ones. Um, I'm gonna sort of try and finish this because I don't have too far to go. So I think I'm okay for time, but um, Diana will do wave at me if I'm not. Um, but I, I've sort of got 10 minutes or so, if that's all right. So we've got brown, red, and yellow species. Uh, this is difficult because some of them merge into the darker ones. And this is where my non-taxonomic boundaries break down because they're ambiguous. Um, but these are some more quite common things you might see. They're not relative to size. So on the left, I forgot to put the small and medium on this one. So on the left, you've got quite little things, up about six or seven millimeters, the left four. Um, our trekkings with the semicircular furrows, remembering, uh, are very small. And on the right, we've got slightly bigger stuff. Um, Platoderis is moderately common, very square pronotum. But uh, we've got some more Lystus, and some of, there are a couple more Lystus species, which I'm about to show you, which are more brownish than, than the dark ones we've already seen. And then another very common one uh, I'll show you another picture of is Parenchus. So two species of brownish Lystus, which you might commonly encounter, are Ferruginaeus, all brown, 
pale antony, pale legs, slice this ferruginaeus. So that's quite a straightforward one. And there's another similar-ish, Lystus terminatus, but that has a black sort of head, slightly darker in the pronotum usually, and the other arrow, it gets blacker again at the end. So that it's a bit more sort of black and red rather than just red. Uh, otherwise, it's clearly quite similar. And then there's two things with, with a kind of weird shape. And I could have put bees in the, in the dark group rather than sort of brown and reddish, but they, they sort of, they could be either. I mean, these are two that I have both, I have both of these in my garden. Uh, they're really beautiful little species. Uh, so you might find them in yours, especially Oxysalathus, a bit of a mouthful. That's a really distinctive pronotum. Again, pronotal shape, really narrow. It's a beetle about seven millimeters, um, brownish little thing. Um, it's pretty widespread in a lot of different sort of open habitats. And then Stomis on the right is another one that likes it damp and shady. Not as common, but it is sort of distributed quite widely. And it's got these big wacky mandibles sticking right up front, very long. Uh, it otherwise is quite similar to the Pterostichus. It's related to Pterostichus, but it's got this big thing sticking out the front. And similar-ish pronotum kind of comes in. Uh, it doesn't come in quite as much. It's not as narrow. That's stomus, think jaws for stomus. I know there's a lot, a lot of species to take in, but there's so many common ones I didn't really know where to stop. And hopefully one or two you can take away and might sink in. And Parenchus, uh, Parenchus think water. It's got very pale legs and you find it by almost any kind of fresh water. So turning over stones on the sides of streams or kind of going out with the torch on the sides of streams and lakes, gravelly shores at night, you will find parenchus. It's really common and really easy to identify with those very pale alpapes, very pale yellow legs. Okay, I'm narrowing down the last few now because we're getting on to the brighter ones. Um, and then my last, my second to last group is the uh, greenish. Um, and it's sort of tenuous as to whether you put in the bronze ones. because Some of the bronzish species have quite a nice bronzy green shine. So again, my categories are breaking down and that's why you go back to the taxonomic group. But uh, I tried. Um, bottom right here, I haven't got another picture of these, so I just dwell on those. You see two with pale sides uh, and bright green metallic on top, otherwise quite similar. Within their genera, they're, they're distinctive. Um, and the, you, you split the two really by, you should just see the shape of that yellow uh, on the cleanest kind of is, there's much more extensive yellow at the base. They're both pretty common. I think Agonum probably more so. Again, wetlands, uh, wetland margins. And the, the uh, Agonum also lacks the little the yellow hairs that Cleanius has, um, because um, this the Cleanius is uh, closer to the Harpalus, the hairy Harpalus. So we've got the hairier beetles, and the Agonum is not, so it's smoother. Both really, really beautiful things. Cleanius especially, one of my favorites. Um, if I pronounce these very differently to everyone else, that's normal, isn't it? We all read them and then when we say them out loud, they sound wrong. Um, so apologies if they do. Uh, and some other common things called poacillus, I'm about to show you, are the green, poacillus are the green version of pterostichus. Uh, and then some smaller stuff I'm not going to have time to talk about. It's a shame because some very cool beetles in there. And more Amara, uh, again. Amara are sort of a bit of a problem. So the one on the left is the commonest Species Amara enia, it's probably the one you see running out on paths in the sunshine. It is, uh, they are the sunshiners, they come out in the sun. Um, and this species is really common, but there are others quite a lot like it, and you're down to microscopic features for identifying them. There's 28 species, and uh, most, mostly they look a bit darker than that. This picture is really beautifully brought out, the, the gold shine. Um, and actually, if you look at uh, Martin's uh, Flickr page, uh, he's got some more images of the specimen, really terrific images of all the features, which was great, would be great for someone verifying, as it was, verifying the species. But Amara, sort of, unfortunately, they're quite difficult. If you see one running across a path, it's quite likely to be this one, but it's sort of difficult to be sure. Uh, I've caught um, a few other species in, in my garden pitfalls, so quite a few common ones. Um, the thing on the right is related to it, Curtinotus, but is much easier to identify because it is like an Amara, but with the wrong shape, pronotum. It's sort of a bit more sinuate again with angles. And I find that I, I identify this one more by where I find it. So Curtinotus, I should have put a picture to trigger the memory, is in seed heads. It, it feeds on seeds. 
uh, wild carrot heads at the end of the summer into the autumn, or just kind of generally sweeping old flower heads uh, in the autumn from a meadow, you will probably get curtainotus. It's one of the few ground beetles you pick up in sweet nets. Uh, and poacillus is also really common. Uh, so it's like a green pterostichus. Um, but how do you tell the difference between this and your green harpalus? Uh, well, you go back to looking for the two, which you can just about see. I haven't put an arrow on. Two little hairs sticking up above the eye instead of one. Obscure, but in my little picture, you can see them. And there are two, there are four species, two rarish on peaths and two quite common. Uh, Cupreus is probably the commonest. And that one is a kind of look up on uh, Mark and John's guide. I've uh, pointed to the sort of pits on the head and the bristles on the leg, which identify the two. So this is one that you do need to get quite good pictures of to be able to verify the species. Again, annoyingly, because they're really common. But if you look at the guide, it sort of tells you what to look for. And my last group is all the really colorful stuff. And um, these help because they have a pattern. So we're not into the realms of it's brownish and blackish having different shapes. You can use color pattern, which uh, from other groups of wildlife is a little bit more familiar. Uh, quite a lot of the uh, beetles with the snipped elytra um, have got really colorful patterns on them, uh, spotty patterns. I'll show you a few in a second. Uh, a few of the small harpalines, so that's one little hair above the eye, sometimes hairy. Those ha have quite a few orange and sort of orange and brown pattern species. And these two on the top right are another two really common ones that are very characteristic. So it's another Calathus, but like it's like the other Calathus, only with a red chronopen. So Calathus melanocephalus, blackhead red chronopen, really super distinctive and quite common in gardens. So that's another nice one I thought to throw in. Ancaminus uh, likes open sort of places, uh, field edges. I was, I didn't find any on the field edge this week, even though uh, my colleagues who had pitfalls there had quite a few, which was irritating. They've probably gone over for the middle of the summer. That's a digression. But this is a really, really just beautiful thing. It's very metallic green, but with kind of yellow um, triangles at the top of the elytra, uh, yellow legs, very slender pronotum, very distinctive looking species again. So you can pick those out. Uh, it's sort of in it, on its own in genus, very easy. Put in a few of the small sort of things with orange and brown triangles, because these are three species you may well find a lot. Um, Badister is another one in gardens, orange and black, but with this orange blob towards the bottom of the wing cases, which a lot of the other species do not have. Some of the very rare Badister also have it, but the, the common Badister species, uh, sort of blackhead, orange pronotum, orange triangles, like many things do, but then it goes down and then this broad orange blob. So look out for that. That's quite a common species on farmland gardens. Uh, Acupalpus I don't find as much, Meridianus, but it's again sort of all black, very, very stylish, sort of jet black with the, the triangles and orange down the middle, but not forming a blob. So they're quite similar, but you can see the subtle difference. And then I haven't found a really good picture of Anthracus, but I put it in because that's one that's turning up again at light. Um, so, and the thing that I find distinctive on this is the pronotum is quite dark, but with yellow around the outside. And it's a small beetle, sort of five millimeters. I should put sizes in too. Um, so anthracus is one which, if you're moth trapping, you might, and you find small yellow and black things, it's worth checking anthracus. And the spotty ones are my very last. Um, the really common one is the one on the left. So this is the one to focus on. This is Dromius quadrimaculatus. It's one of the few ground beetles you find wandering around in trees, uh, on bark. Uh, I've also found them sort of sheltering in bird boxes when I've emptied out nest boxes at the end of the season. Uh, that is quite a good way to find it, actually. Um, and it's got these big yellow patches at the end of the elytra, which kind of separate it from some of the less common lookalikes. It's also a bit bigger, so six or seven millimetres for Dromius, more like four for these two. And the one in the middle is relatively common. It is different. It also has a dark note, Dromius orange, Dromius in trees. That's it. So we've, we've, we've learned about 50 species or so straight off, but I know there's loads to take in. Um, but I'm going to just finish with a few slides on recording and then we've got time for questions, I think. Um, so I started off telling you a little bit about the ground beetle recording scheme and how I stumbled into it. And I do look at this uh, page on the UK beetle recording website, panic a bit, because it says it's currently led by me. And the previous organizer, Mark Telfer, who knows everything, and Martin Luff, who literally wrote the book. 
So uh, there's a lot to live up to. So, uh, but it's a, it's a great journey to be on. And I say, I'm sure there'll be other people along on it in the near future. So the scheme itself has got about 400,000 records nearly. And when we get there after a big fanfare, um, for ground beetles overall, from other sources as well, you'll see almost 580,000 in the MBN Atlas now. So we know a fair amount about where they are. It's not as much as some of the really recorded stuff, but pretty well recorded. Records back to at least 1839 and the newest from just today. So a big, a big stretch in time too. Um, now I can throw in the rare species we'll see just because they're pretty. Uh, I, I do prefer records to come in by iRecord now because I'm moving everything into the iRecord sort of machinery to the database. I'm also very happy for people to just email me and say I've seen a brown beetle or contact the scheme on Twitter and then we can go in and get you into iRecord or take spreadsheets or, or similar. Uh, so I might try and get some more people along. See, I'm working on all these ID resources and eventually want to find places to hang those and ways of using them. Um, when you do make a record, if, if you want to send me spreadsheets, I sort of, I'll accept spreadsheets within reason, but I kind of want to be confident that the records are, are good. So if you're confident, a confident recorder, I'm happy with spreadsheets, but it's good if you've kind of checked things if you can, and that the records have all the relevant things for making a normal biological record. What did you find? Where was it? When did you find it? And to give us a bit more color in the record, maybe uh, how you found it, where, what was it doing, sort of what's it interacting with, those things actually give us a lot more value to the records for being able to work out what's going on with species more than just where they are. So iRecord is very easy to use. I know there's the app which people get very into. Um, if you've got a phone with a really good macro, you might be able to take a picture of a ground beetle in the field and use the app, potentially. I go through the website because that's just sort of the way I work and because my phone pictures are not that great, so if it's a group I'm not a regular recorder of, I always will include a picture because the, the, the verifiers don't know who I am. Why should they trust me? So I try and put in a picture. Um, so this is just an example of making a record on iRecord. This is a beautiful sort of uh, Broscus cephalotes, massive, great, chunky beast of a wonderful ground beetle you find uh, sort of drift lines on the beach. Found it under a big piece of driftwood on Holy Island in Northumberland a few weeks ago. So I, I've gone to iRecord, enter a list of records, and I've said I saw one of these. Drops down with the whole UK species inventory. So you just type in the species name and the right one should appear to select. I've said I was sure. I said there was one that's an adult beetle and it's identified by me, uh, which automatically fills. It was on the 7th of July, my wedding anniversary. Uh, my wife was with me. Um, I did manage to get in a bit of beetling. And the next thing that it wants to know is where you were. So I've gone very helpful map feature you can zoom right in and try and figure out so in that picture i've got a one kilometer square i did then zoom in further and select the 100 meter because i found in satellite view the path where we'd walked onto the beach worked out where the log was that i overturned so i've gone to 100 meters for the record but kilometer is fine put in the resolution of which you're most that you're sure is is right uh, and that's that's just what i record looks like uh, i put in the habitats well i said i was on the coastal dune and sandy shore it was under driftwood to give that context and then I've gone to my verification window and sure enough put in Broscus and this record has now appeared waiting for me sort of slightly circuitously to verify it bothers me that I can but um, there it is I'm sure that's what it was that's iRecord do send me photos on iRecord they don't have to be brilliant um, these two enable me to identify the species just about harpless roof peas because it's law of averages there's one more with the hairs that you hardly ever see uh, and those yellow hairs on the back picked out in the light of the moth trap. And Caribus nemoralis, violet and bronze in combination with the dimples. It's a terrible picture, but you can tell what it is. And then for some other species, you can get them in the hand and some practice picking them up. They are quite robust. You can pick them up by two legs, hold them aloft and take some closer pictures. Uh, I, I have to do it the right way around. I tried pick, holding one in my right hand and doing the camera with the left earlier this week. That was hopeless. And we're getting some really interesting stuff coming in, especially from moth traps. So this is a species which you see there was increasing in numbers. It's quite a rare thing sort of associated with um, brownfield sites in the east of England. And it's suddenly cropping up all over the country at light. Not being seen on the ground, but it's been seen at light. And last year and on the hot nights, it was dispersing all over the place. So I find that really interesting. 
Ophonus, the, the lovely blue metallic thing again, is similar. Last year, another peak of records, all at light, uh, probably expanding its distribution on those hot nights, which are good for beetle flight. And we've got some other nice, other sort of eastern brownfield species with new locations and interesting places, uh, both of which I hope to have news on for you soon. So there's exciting stuff going on. And if you want to know where to go to record ground beetles, um, just launching, I think the news is sort of emerging, is this new thing called the targeting revisits map. You might have seen one for grasshoppers. Uh, we've now got one for ground beetles, which is brilliant. The um, Folk Biological Records Centre have been beavering away on this. Uh, really pleased. So they, they've got on the whole country, you can kind of zoom in and got color coded squares for ones that we need to revisit to be able to include the square in species trends. So anything in pink is somewhere where there are records for one year. And if we can get records for a second year, um, it can be those squares can then be included in trend analysis and uh, make them more powerful. So, and it's, it's just quite a fun of, right, I could go there, I could go here, I need to look for this species. So it's just a bit of fun, but it will actually really help with our knowledge of what's going on with population size. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, that was excellent. I really liked um, the, the approach you, you took this evening with just with, you know, showing key features and going through um, many of the many of the beetles through through color and, and some of the distinctive ones just showing exactly what you what you need to do to identify them. Um, because you just don't, when I uh, started looking at ground beetles, I, you know, I was just using the key yep, and yep. and uh, you can really wade through and, and just I remember right at the beginning you were talking about um, where you have the incision in the um, in the yeah. end front um, ephemera and then and I just uh, yeah that was getting the right tough, angle is, is really difficult. That was a yeah. real, you, you're looking at all different angles. You're really trying <laughs> trying to work out where to go in that in that sort of one of the very first couplets. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things I try to do is. And I do this for myself when I'm using a key, it's kind of take a step back and say, well, where is that cup taking me? And if I go this way, what groups do I have? If I go that way, what species do I have? And what do they look like? Sort of to, to kind of get more of a feel for what that is actually splitting. Otherwise, say it's just a, you look at one bit of the beetle instead of the whole animal. And the whole animal looks like itself. You know, they're quite similar, but they're not identical. Um, no, so I did see... Sorry, I saw the question about flight pop up again. So if it's not completely out of context, I can address that. Yeah. Um, so it, it depends basically on the species. There are, there are quite a few, a, a lot of the larger species who are flightless. Some have completely fused elytra. They basically can't fly. Um, but a lot of the smaller ground beetles fly really well. It often depends on habitat too. So those associated with uh, some, some more ephemeral or early successional habitats make sense, are more likely to fly because they, they need to, to, to stay in the right place. Those associated with a more stable habitat like woodland are less likely to fly. And there are some which um, will have uh, sort of flighted forms and will then disperse. And then when they get there, the, the generations will lose the power of flight over time. So within a species, it varies, which is, yeah, interesting. Sorry, it's, it's not a simple answer, but it's a really interesting question. Yeah, no, no, fascinating. No, I, I said femora before, but it's tibia, of course, that, that, yeah, had, that, yeah, that yeah. had that incision. Um, um, okay, um, well, the, the first question uh, for you, Chris, that, I, that yeah. I've got here is from uh, Tia. Um, is the presence or absence of the antennal cleaner related to lifestyle? Yeah, I, I feel like it should be, but I'm not sure I have a straightforward answer. Someone else here might know. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's a feeling that the, the antennal cleaner is a sort of later feature in ground beetle evolution, but then if it's useful, they, they would all have it. So I think it must be. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think a, set, a sort of a second part of that question, if or just a second question yeah, yeah. from the same person. If hair, if the hair in Cetiferous puncture mm. 
or punctures is is missing is there an identifiable pore left yes there is yeah it's just it's just much more difficult to find so under a microscope like with with nice flat light they're, they're relatively easy to see when, and, when there's no hair yeah and you usefully mentioned that if there is one then it's likely to be more in the middle of the eye yeah. and, and if there's two yeah so if you've got one right at the edge of the eye then yeah if just one is missing of the two you can usually still and it, you'd be very unlucky to have the same one missing on either side too so it yeah yeah you, yeah of course you've got that that parallel thing going on yeah. so look look at both sides um okay great uh so question from steve docker hi chris thanks for a great presentation very useful is the target revisits map available now in iRecord so yeah um there is if you sort of just google targeting revisits map brown beacons it, it should appear um i've just tried the link that i had in an email but i i will i'll push it out on our on our um, twitter as well but it i, I think biological records center have a blog coming out on it too so it it should start appearing in lots of places but yeah it, it is available as a as a map online um Okay, and then a question from Elizabeth Brooks. Um, can you recommend a microscope for IDing beetles, or if not, a good supplier who can provide a recommendation? Mm. I, I don't think I have one recommendation, because um, I, I tend to be lucky enough to just borrow stuff from where I work, so I, I don't really think about what's being bought. So you probably want, to, if anyone here has recently bought a microscope for use at home and would like to help, that's probably the best way. I mean, just in general terms, I think a, a zoom stereo microscope, probably with magnification up to at least 40 is where I'd start. The, the zoom is invaluable. And for some of the stuff on ground beetles, you want reasonably good magnification. Um, that, that's, yeah. So that's the way to start, but there, there are quite a few good suppliers and uh, there'll be lots of opinions. But. Yeah, so I think people are writing in the chat already and and yeah. and actually on the recording, we're not really, as a public body, we're not really supposed to recommend particular companies. Um, but so yeah. would, you, would there be, do you ever need more than times 40, Chris? Um, very rarely, yeah, just... No, no, from from almost all the ground beetles, no. Yeah, and, and most most of the microscopes you'd buy now uh, do go up to that, don't they? Yeah. So, um, yeah, often often forty or forty five or fifty even, and that, and before you start getting into big um, f uh, costs. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Okay, from a uh, question from David Coles. Does night searching produce good numbers of species? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think to myself what counts as a good number of species because so I'm not one of the real wizard recorders, but you can you can have find on the right night in the right conditions, sort of nice, sort of slightly humid, mild, overcast, going out with a torch and just wandering around. You, you'd be surprised. Yeah, record a very decent number of species. Not putting a number on it really depends where you are. I, I think one of one of the things I really love doing is we um, through work. I before we no longer could do this sort of thing had an annual field course down at Slapton Lay in Devon, and I, I really enjoyed doing some recording of beetles at night um, on the lake margins and river margins. That's, that's really fun. So exposed mud and, and gravel when they start running around. But, but you can just go out to sort of local paths. I, I live near a canal tow path and they'll be wandering around the, the grass and across the path there at night. Yeah, so it's, so, it's, it's fun to actually see, you know, ground beetles moving around rather than just picking up a trap, finding out what you have. It's... Yeah, it, I was just thinking even where I used to live in a very urban position, even at night time, you know, walking the dog on a mild night, you're still you'll still get ground beetles running, running across yeah. the paths. Um, but would you, would you say, would you say woodland is the most productive, Chris, or any? Um, difficult. Um, I, woodland may be less so, it's just, unless you have good path to watch something, it depends on the kind of recording you're doing. Yeah. 
there are certain species you get in huge numbers in, in woodland in the right place. Turning over logs in woods is always good. And is it, and are there, are there a lot of species that you, <coughs> you sort of quite easily find at night, but, but even in the daytime turning over stones and things you're struggling to find, or, or can you just, can, could you just rely on daytime visits if you were trying to do a really good comprehensive survey of a, of, for ground Pro beetles? Prob probably, yeah, if, if you know where they're hiding. And the only exception would be, I'm just thinking about some of those species that seem to just disappear down a hole, but, uh, and then they may come out at night. So some of those which are coming into the light trap and then I'm not seeing the rest of the time. So there, there probably are some, but uh, yeah, an experience, a more experienced uh, surveyor than I certainly would, would, I think, do a perfectly decent job in the daytime. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, a question from Harley, um, Matheson, I'm, I'm sorry about pronunciation there. Yeah. I use iNaturalist because my ID skills are wanting. Does the data eventually end up on the NBN? At the moment it doesn't, um, but I think that it's a work in progress. So that, that's sort of a question for um, the iRecord team, I think. They, they, the, the iNaturalist data used to go into iRecord and then it stopped for various reasons. Um, to do with the, the link up and verification. I think they're now working on a way to link them up again. So when that happens, yes, it will. But I, I don't know whether there's going to be a black hole in the middle where it doesn't, is all, all I would say. Okay, thanks, Chris. Is, is there any, do you know any time frame on, on that or? Uh, all I saw was later this, later this year. So it's just kind of a watch this space, I think. Okay, great. Um, Right, a question from Robert's iPad. If studying a single location, is it worth collecting single voucher specimens to help with ID over time? Definitely. Um, for, for yourself, especially for, well, a, a for being confident that you have what you have and then having voucher specimens to refer back to is, is ever so helpful for your own identification. Um, and for a site, a single one, to, of each species from a site is, is not a massive impact. So unless you know that you have, you've just, unless you know you've just picked up something super rare, then there's, there's low impact. So I, I would definitely go for that. Great, I, sh I, sh I should say at, at this point that of course, of course, Liana and I work for uh, National Museums Liverpool and we have a very good collection, very uh, representative of, of UK species at least of, of Carabids, um, and you, when I, I, I I'll, I'll say, hopefully in the in the autumn at least, you can you can come in, uh, and you can uh, all you have to do is drop our assistant curator an email and say I want to come in and look at the ground beetles, and you can spend all day there. You can spend you could do spend nine till five every day, Monday to Friday if you want, just looking at the at the ground beetles. So, you know, it's a it's a publicly funded um museum centrally funded by government and it's for you and you're paying for it so you should come and use the the facilities that are being preserved you know curated so that you can so that they can help you so please do come and use it we'll, well i'm sure we'll heavily advertise it when we're actually behind the scenes is is sort of open again but yeah. um i look forward to that day especially for some of the trickier groups that uh, our collections are absolutely invaluable just be able to say, so, oh, it is that one, because so, there, is, there it is in front of you. There's nothing else like it. Yeah, and, and for the, some of the tricky, the trickier species, having a, having a series, you can really appreciate the difference, I think, yeah. in, in some of the key uh, couplets. Okay, so uh, another question from David Coles. Um, do you have to watch your light trap at silly hours to see the carabids? Uh, yeah, a little, a little bit. Um, they don't tend to go into the moth trap. I get very few actually in the trap. Uh, lots of them will sit around. If you put up a white sheet near the trap, they will land on that, land around the trap, maybe on the trap. Uh, but I, I don't. I see them come in at, you know, once it's, once it's dark, they'll start arriving. I've not tried, I'm just too lazy to try going well into the night to say whether I would have seen even more species in the garden later. So, but you do, you do have to go out and watch it for a while in the dark because by, by the morning, there'll be 
So I get the odd one in the trap, but I see a lot more if I do watch it. It's the simple answer. Yeah, no, I, I, I was thinking that where, where I, because I, when I have to have my light trap out in the garden, I just, I don't even bother looking at it till the morning. But when I've gone out with a light at a, at a site, I do notice the ground beetles a lot more um, on the on the sheets and things because yeah. there's just not many get in the trap. Um, but I think most families of beetles come quite early, quite early in the night to turn, turn up at light. Well, good, good that I'm probably not missing much by going to bed at a sensible time. <laughs> yeah, I think um, someone like Clive Washington, I think he he stays around early, early with the trap and gets most of the things that then uh, are sort of gone by by the morning. Um, uh, so a question from Wendy um, Scase. Do they bite if you pick them up? Um, they might try. Uh, so yeah, I mean they sort of wriggle around and they have to go and they might give you a nip, but it's pretty, it's pretty inoffensive. And uh, the larger species more so. So I'm trying to get less ten. I'm always tentative handling anything, but which is silly because I've, I've handled much larger and, much uh, more well-equipped birds in the past so i should be used to it but yeah just just if you're in charge of the beetle it's just a tiny pinprick really it's just sometimes it surprises you and then you drop them yeah i've i've, I've certainly seen coleopterists get there you know where the mandibles going into their finger and it doesn't look very nice so i'm always a bit tentative <laughs> yeah. and probably have avoided it some more than others uh, yeah. i think oh, some are worse than others yeah very much oh we do have a question there so from ellen wilson if there was one species you'd like us all to look out for what would it be it's difficult to choose one of 360 70 um because it might be more opportunistic i i would like lots of well one thing i would like is as many photo records as possible of pterostichus matibus because i'm really interested in the distribution of the two leg color morphs. There's some really old work on that. It'd be fun to know more. So picture records of, of anything are great because for, we can pick up more value. The other one is the violet ground beetle, Carabus violaceus. Really nice pictures of that. The more, the better. Uh, because there, there is a thing about a potential subspecies distribution, a sort of thing I'd like to investigate. And if you have good pictures, then might be able to do a bit more of that. So those are two. And quite common, Great. so everyone should be able to find, hopefully. Great, thank you. Well, I hope I hope people do that. Um, oh, so a question from uh, Joris Rock: Which carabid has the strongest bite? Yeah. Thanks, Joris. Uh, yeah, I, I know Joris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with. Well, some of the carabus are the bigger, so I'm going to assume they've got the stronger jaws. But I, I couldn't say I put it to the test. There's there's some tropical things in the museum which um, look look pretty menacing. Yeah, um, but, I think uh, it depends on the prey as well, probably, as to what sort of bite force is actually needed. Yeah, it's an interesting question yeah. to think about. Yeah, I guess with with. Uh, some of the dung beetles, they probably measured some things well about how much force they can, yeah. they can exert and carry, but I don't know, mandible strength. Um, so, oh, oh Tia uh, just saying, engaging, useful and motivational, excellent talk. When is part two? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so. Got quite a few species that. to go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I Ben Bidian are a real are a real troublesome lot. Uh, give give I, me a few years for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goodness me, I can go a long way in a key and not not get very anywhere. Um, sorry, there's so there's so much chat going on. I just want to make sure I haven't missed a question. I don't think so. Just lots of thank yous and people saying what a great talk you've given. So. Um, oh, uh, do, do any eat wood lice? Says 
Angela Price. I can't think of a woodlouse specialist. I'm sure some of the species do. Um, because some, some of them are just general opportunist omnivores, really. So, yes, but it's not, I, I don't have in my head a particular species that is a woodlouse specialist, but I'm sure they would. It's too obvious a food source, and they're in the same kind of places often. Yeah, you, you, you see, I mean, some of the larger carabids, you, you see them at night time, you know, going really into slugs. Yeah. And I think, well, what, why do you need to be that fast to, to be predating slugs? Why do you need to be that athletic to be going mm -hmm. after them? But maybe they eat a lot of other things opportunistically. Yeah. I would also mean they have the speed, so they can always use that to escape since they're a nice yeah. big crunchy snack to something else. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think, you know, th this, is, this has been a really, a really nice evening. I, I think we've, it's, been a, it's been a long time, I think almost since the beginning of the Tipter project, maybe 2017, that we did anything uh, on, on ground beetles. Hmm. So it's, it's, been, it's been really nice to, to, to listen to you. And, and, and as I said, the, the approach you, you've taken is, is really, it's gonna be really helpful to me at least. And I'm sure yeah. lots of other people as well. And uh, yeah, yeah, good luck with your, um, your sort of guides, your things you're working on. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, we we'll look, can look forward to- Figure to out that. where to go with it, but it's, it's really nice to have that feedback. Appreciate it.